I've broken down, but that's okay. <laughs> I can deal with that. We're going to be looking. I was telling Bill all my books and stuff and lessons are at home. I always have that kind of stuff prepared for whatever reason because of these circumstances. And lo and behold, it's sitting there in my den where it could be here. But anyway, we're going to look at, if we will, the parable of the lost. I guess this prodigal son, I think I like to deal with that one because Jesus has so many great stories that we can look at into the Bible. And when we think of these parables or these stories, God is trying to tell you and I something about a sin for soul, a person that is lost, and how to react and respond and deal with those circumstances. I mean, it's just fantastic how he can tell these stories and give us insight on them. And, and that's so important and so significant to you and I that it just blows my mind. And like I say, we're going to look at here the parable of the lost son, beginning at Luke 15, verse, starting verse 11. This is right after he continued to talk about the lost corn. He said, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So that he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the young son got together all he had, set off of a distance to a country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. <laughs> Let's pause here for a moment. Here, here this guy, first of all, you, you can imagine this is the story of God dealing with a sinner in a sense here. But when we look at this, here this guy, he goes to the father and says, give me my inheritance or give me my share of the property. And being back in those days, you know, I'm sure in the Jewish concept how it was set up, you had these different categories of how much you may receive. I'm not sure the amount of that, but he wanted his share. He felt like he wanted to go out and do his own thing. I don't know about you, but my kids, I've talked to them a lot, and I can share with you one of the stories I was telling one of my kids about doing stuff and doing the right thing. And they quoted to me, well, Dad, let me make my own mistakes. Your children ever tell you stuff like that? <laughs> let me make my own mistakes. It sounds like they think they know where they're going, they know where they're headed to, but they don't have a clue. They don't have an idea at all. But what has happened with this idea, I think, Satan has gotten into their hearts, gotten into their mind, and deceived them some kind of way to cause them to feel and think like that. But they know what to do and know how to do it. But at the same time, they don't have a clue. And sometimes we're like that. We, we get lost. We get caught up. That's why Jesus tells us, yet you live in this world, but don't be confirmed to his ideas. Don't get caught up in all the bells and whistles. Because be mindful, Satan, when he comes after you, he's not going to come as we had this idea of horns and all that devil suit, so to speak. No, he's going to come at you in a subtle way to where you don't realize what he's doing to you until he, you're caught like this young lad as we continue the story here and you're lost. And that's a terrible, terrible situation to be in, to be lost away from God. Again, I said after he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. Wow. You know, here this guy, he had it made back home. He had the best of living. But at the same time, he I don't know how long this probably may have taken him to squander and lose what he had. I guess figuratively speaking, this time I could go pretty quick. You can lose it overnight <laughs> if you think about the circumstances here today. So it wouldn't take long. And then it goes on to say, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. It, I'm sure this was very humiliating to a Jew. <laughs> you know, put yourself in that situation. I don't know about you. I take pride in my family. My mom always told me, and I told the kids, too, when they would go out, I said, guys, don't do anything to embarrass the family. Don't do stuff that you will regret or we will regret one day in our lives. 
And that's what you try to tell and teach and share that to your kids. You want to teach and tell them how to live. But at the same time, you have this other side over here is tugging after them, trying to tell them. You know, I remember one time my daughter told me, this guy told her, you need to get off the titty, you know, get off the milk, cut the umbilical cord, come out and live. My kid shared those. I said, are you serious? She said, yeah, Dad. That's I said, did you listen? Don't listen to that kind of voices. It's not healthy for you. It is wrong. It will destroy you. So you can see kids, but at the same time, they want to be accepted. They want to fit in. I know many of you listened to my grandson last Sunday about his stories, his life as a teen. That's hard for those guys. We didn't have all the media exposure, the web stuff out there today, the Twitter accounts, etc. It's so much out there that they can be engaged in that we don't have a clue what's affecting them, how their lives are being handled. But Satan, he's taking advantage of every circumstance of that. He, he do us the same way if we're not careful. We have to be mindful. Don't get caught up with the ideas of the world. Don't get caught up with those vices because it will destroy you. It will lead you in a pathway that will be very, very destructive down the road. Again, it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. You know, again, this guy, he was in a situation where he had the best. He knew what he had back home. But he found himself hungry in a hog pen, storming to the point of death. Very, very bad situation. He goes on to say, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned. You know, again, here he's, thank goodness God's words still resonate in his heart and his mind. Because sometimes people get so far out there, God's word cannot penetrate their souls. You ever heard the statement used, this is the parable where your sins become so bad or so rough until the conscience doesn't recognize that you at that point. I know we've seen people like that. We've had brothers and sisters in the church like that. Our families have been like that. They get so far out there and you, they just can't get back. Their conscience becomes seared. You know, it's within hard iron it talks. And I guess when you take a hard iron, if you take it and put it on a piece of plastic, it bonds together and it loses can't, nothing can penetrate, no air or anything. That's the way the heart gets sometimes. It gets so cold, so callous, so distant with God until God's word doesn't mean anything to them anymore. They, they're lost. And this is where Satan wants you and I to be. He wants you to be in a situation where God cannot reach you. His word doesn't mean anything to you anymore. You're, you're in a terrible state. But thank goodness this guy, he realized that he was in a situation he went to the father and explained and shared with the father, I have sinned. That takes courage to do that. It takes a, an honest person, a genuine person. But sometimes, you know, like I say, you can get so low until that's all you can do is look up and ask God for mercy and forgiveness. And as he said, he said, I not only sinned against the father, but I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer Worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Again, you can see the attitude is beginning to unfold. He's beginning to get the idea of reconciling, getting things back right with God so he can be there. He can do the right thing. And, and I'm so humbled to read this lesson to you and share it with you. And, and that's what we have to keep encouraging our family members and our loved ones when they get this way. Again, he said, so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And I, I can just see that picture as you think of the Jewish custom, how we talk about saluting one another with a holy kiss. I, I can just see all the, the hugging and embracing going on here between the son and the father. 
that's a delightful sense. That's a delightful picture, a great invitation that we can, a great metaphor we can look at and think about how circumstances could get better for us, how they can become so great. But at the same time, this is the way God feels about you and I when we return from our state of sinfulness. And it's good that God has that mindset about us. It's good that God loves you that much, love me that much. Because I know God loved me, no doubt about that. I remember as a little lad growing up, I lost my dad, I guess, at a real early age. I was probably third, fourth grade, somewhere in that nature. But mom got this idea of she wanted me to be around in a male adult. So she sent me to her brother in New Jersey to live. Ah, man, bad idea. She didn't know that at that time. But she thought by giving me that male figure, I would have someone to kind of guide me and lead me in the right way. But here this guy, he didn't go to church. He drank a lot. He cheated on his wife. So here I was exposed to all this kind of stuff as a young lad. But mom didn't have a clue. But I thought, you know, here I am. I can do my own thing, do what I want. Because this guy, he had no boundaries. I did what I wanted to do my way, you know, just as this prodigal son did his own thing. But I look back on that and I look at myself today and I thank God every day for that, you know, because it could have been so different. Because as I recall, talking to some of my relatives up there, all the people that I grew up with back then, they're dead. They either got killed, was on drugs, lost their lives. But God, again, he knew he had something in store for me. And I'm thankful that he kept his hand on me and protected me. I mean, I can go on and on telling you stories, make, make the hair stand up on your head or some of the atmospheres that I was around and involved with. But we don't need to get onto that. But again, just to let you know, here I was, that prodigal son too at one point in my life. But God said, I still love you. I'm going to help you get back. And he did. And I'm humbled to that. I'm grateful to that. Then the father said, he said, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father didn't let him stop there. He said, the father said to his servant, quick, bring the best robe and put on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is what God does when a sinner returns home, how he treats him, how he takes care of him. I mean, we are all sinners. We may not be this type, but we all, again, are sinners. And this is the way God responds to you and I when we return back to him. And I think that's the way we need to look at each other always, because I can't thank God enough. I mean, he gave me a beautiful wife, my wife Joanne, because, like I said, I dated other girls that was not part of the family or the church, as you may say, and they were nothing like what you should look at as a Christian. Again, I thank God every day for her. And matter of fact, Joanne was the one that helped me get back on the right path, helped me make that decision. It was reassuring to me that all is going to be well. Because the girls I dated, like I said, they wasn't Christian girls. So they, they parted, we parted, we did stuff that was not right as a child of God. But God said, I'm still going to hold you in the cares of my hands. And he comforted me and he reassured me. And believe me, when Joe and I got together, it all stopped. That's crazy, but it stopped. That type of lifestyle was no more. I I'll never forget one time she told me, you may not know this about me, but I used to smoke. And she told me, she said, uh, if you want to hold our kids, you're going to have to quit smoking. And you know what? God helped me to do that. I mean, I wasn't a heavy, heavy smoker, but I did do it. Wasn't healthy for me. But she had enough sense to say, 
you're not going to destroy our kids with your cigarette smoke. I'm thankful that I listened to that. I didn't dig in. You know how sometimes we get stubborn and say, this is me, this is who I am. She wasn't boastful about it. She wasn't arrogant about it. She said it in a loving way. And again, I thank God every day for helping me to lay that habit down. You know, don't get me, I'm not beating up on smokers in here. Trust me, I'm not doing, I'm talking about me, <laughs> me only. So don't think that I'm out here pointing fingers at someone because that's not my agenda here today at all. Again, thank God so much for loving me and caring about me and helping me and thank Joanne likewise. And see what, give you along another story about Joanne and I. My brother, see our family back in our neighborhood, we was, we don't have the relationship today in neighborhoods like we had back then, but like her sister went to college with my brother at Southwestern. This is in Terrell, Texas. Likewise, her brothers used to come to our house and stuff, and they played with each other. So I knew those guys before I even knew Joanne. And so I knew I had to find, I had always told myself that I wanted to marry a Christian girl. Again, God, see, that goes to show you, if you keep focus and stay in that plan, stay in that cycle, God will put you in where you need to be in your life. And he blessed me with her. And coming up this August, we will be having been married 43 years. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's humble. I'm proud of it. I'm grateful of that. And, but again, he gave me a Christian lady, a woman that I needed in my life, and I'm so thankful for that. As we go on and continue the story, as the father told him to bring all his accolades out to help celebrate the son bringing home, here we go with another part of this story which we all need to be careful about. Beginning at verse 28 there, it says, The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Can you imagine? Why would you get mad with your brother coming home? He was lost. He was eating with the swine. He was hungry. No clothing. He was a destitute. But this is what happens sometimes. You know, we, we miss the mark or we can be at home and be lost. You know, like when you come to church, I don't know about you, but the writer also tells us, <laughs> I believe there in Matthew, what God tells you and I about having your heart right with God or your mindset when you, before you come to worship or before you give your offering. He said, if you have a fault against your brother or your sister, you go to that brother. You reconcile whatever that grievance is, whatever that difference is, before you make your offering. Because if not, your offering is not acceptable. Your heart is not right with God. He don't want you. You may think, well, I'm giving this, I'm giving, I'm doing this, all this servant work. But if your attitude and your mind is not right, it's not acceptable. Not me. God is saying these words. So keep that in mind when you get mad about little things or something. I don't know how many of you was here Wednesday night on Bill's lesson on about, you know, how we treat each other. Right, Bill, if I'm not mistaken? Think about that idea. If you didn't hear it, go back to the website and listen to it. You can hear some great things there, to what we need to do and how we ought to be. Let your opinion be your own opinion, even though sometimes we're not going to always agree 100%. Nobody's going to agree 100% all the time. We can agree and disagree and still love one another, can't we? And that's the way it should be as a family of God. But going on back to the older brother, he says, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Again, this guy, apparently he is really upset. He's frustrated. What's going on? And he goes on to say, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son, not my brother, when this son, <laughs> you can see the anger in his heart. He don't even recognize him as his brother. He said, he squandered your property with prostitutes. And then comes home and you kill the fatted calf for him. Wow. What a loss. What a, a bad attitude to have for your brother. Could he not have been grateful that his brother, his brother could have been killed maybe. You know, do you feel sorry or have compassion for a lost sinner out there? I, I know sometimes if you're not fully engaged or aware 
as this sign was here, we don't get the full accolade. We don't understand the whole picture of that. But still, at some time, we, I knew as I grew up as a lad, I would see brothers and sisters come forth and they would make a confession. And some of the people there, they didn't love them. They didn't embrace them. They didn't give them the support they needed. And see, Satan just loved this kind of stuff. He loves to see us beat up on each other, destroy one another. That's not what we're supposed to be about. We suppose, how are we going to show the world that we love one another and we're children of God if this is the mindset we have? Even our folks in the church are about small subject matters. Sometimes we get frustrated and we do stuff that is not Christian, like our attitudes is not all that favorable. Don't give Satan a foothold. Don't let him get the best of you because that's his objective. I know sometimes we forget and remember the words that have been said. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking those who he may devour. And believe me, Satan is real, people. He don't come out always as a lion. He don't come out always as the devil, we may say, with horns on. He's coming with you in denying and scheming ways so how he can destroy you. That's his objective. And you give him that opportunity, he'll do it. And I'm encouraging you, don't let him get a foothold on you. Please don't let him do that. Yeah, we're going to get disappointed. Yes, we're going to be heartbroken at times. People are going to let us down. But that's okay. Life goes on. The most important thing is continue serving God and doing his will. Pray, asking God to give you strength in your heart so you can deal with whatever deficiencies may be going on with your life with another individual in the body here. Because believe me, we can be lost right here at home. Don't deceive yourself. Don't get so caught up thinking that you have arrived. We've not. Each and every day, we have to keep striving. We have to keep building, trying to get where we need to be with God. Because I don't think anybody here can say they got it all together. If you do think that, we need to talk. I'd like to talk with you a little bit if you think you have already arrived here. The son goes on to say, he says, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What an awesome story that is. What a humbling story that is. I don't know about you. When you think of the idea of being lost, separated from God, that's a terrible circumstance to be in. That's a very scary, scary situation. I I don't know about you, but when you are like that, I I just can imagine finding and feeling yourselves at a distance. Sometimes people get so frustrated or so angry, they can't pray. That's scary when you can't pray to God. Sometimes they get so far out there, they feel God is at a distance in their lives. That's scary too, because that's what Satan wants you and I to be. He, he wants you to have that concern about, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to f- get through this. I can't fix this. He wants you to feel despair. He wants you to feel hopeless. You don't have to let Satan do that to you because you're a child of God. I, I love what Paul talks about in Philippians 4. But Paul tells you and I, I can do all things. Not something, but I can do all things through Christ. No matter, no matter what the circumstances is, no matter what the situation is, I can do this through Christ because God loves you just like he loved this lost son here. He loves you that much. He wants to put a ring on your finger. He wants to give you the fatted calf. He wants you to have a party, a celebration, to be welcomed back into the fold. And that's what we have to be about, welcoming individuals, striving to seek and save those that are lost. Not just here in the body, but this lost world, this generation your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers. We need to share 
and carry ourselves in a way where they can see Christ living in you. They don't need to see that side of Satan, which we all got that in us. Like I said, I could have been so easily like my friends were that I lived in New Jersey with for a while. But I thank God every day for my life. I never dreamed, hadn't imagined that I would be where I am today. But I know it's all because of the grace of God. Again, God had a real plan for Joe and I because it's so strange when we got married in 75. We came here to the Smokies for our honeymoon. I'm living in South Georgia at this time. This is 75. 76, guess where Johnny was? Back here in Oak Ridge. Yeah, that, my daughter was born in May. We got married in August of 75. You see the quick turnaround there? Very short span. The reason I had to be here because I came to work for the plant. I had lost my job there in Georgia. I won't go into that either because that was another bad day. But anyway, God said, I'm going to put you here in Oak Ridge. Get you away from that atmosphere too. And to show you how God is on time, wow, man, let me get this story out real quick. My daughter was born one day. I received a job the very next day. God is an on-time God. He's not this God that out here is a myth you don't know nothing about. He's going to be there. He's going to take care of you. Again, I hope that I've said words to you that will lift your spirit and guide you closer to God. I hate that I had to do this on a short term, but again, that's what I do sometimes. And I thank God for helping me to do this. And I pray that you will continue to grow in Christ and be strong each and every day. Thank you.